we are in 2011 in uh, Birmingham city centre. Um, the UK currently has the highest drug related death rate in Europe, has done so for many years now. Um, we know that over half of Birmingham uh, injecting drug users are hepatitis C positive. We are already providing them injecting equipment through needle exchanges and chemists uh, for them, uh, knowingly that they're going to inject illegal drugs. Um, Unfortunately, there is uh, no safe place for them to do so, uh, for the hard to reach and vulnerable people, so they have to resort to coming to places like these. Um, if you look at the state of this place, um, highly, highly unhygienic, uh, it's cold, it's very poor lighting, obviously there's no washing facilities. If you look at the needles on the floor, uh, most of them are left uncapped. Um, there's human feces through that door uh, in this back room. Um, the conditions are completely appalling. Um, and the aim of this video is to highlight the, the problem we have in this city, basically. Is it our duty of care? Can we let people inject in, those situation, in this situation? Can we let the harm carry on? I asked passers-by what they thought about places like this. As you can see, um, obviously, evidence of drug taking. Yeah. Most of the needles are uncapped, you can see yeah? Yeah. You have to pop your head through there, through there and see the uh, extent. There's not much lighting, unfortunately, but as you can see, yeah? You wouldn't want to do it, um, let alone a human being, to, um, to be taking drugs like this. You know, if you're going to do it, give, give it a place to you know, a nice clean environment, somewhere where they can get help. It's a dis disgrace, isn't it? It's a disgrace, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. In yeah. this DNA. It's only making people worse, isn't it? To come here in the, the, the first place. These people got nowhere to go, so I figure the best uh, option is to like, pull into the closest, uh, most secure dock place in there. Yep. And yep. Um, it's just like, look, man, these guys, NHS, everybody spend uh, billions and billions of different stuff, and uh, where the money is, I. Um, actually needed. This is a problem also um, for the environment uh, secretary, um, the health secretary. Yes. These are the guys that need to get together, sit down with local communities, in, like in every major, like in every major city mm. uh, in England, and, and figure out and work out a situation. Because, yes. Um, yes. This is um, this is preposterous. The good news is there is a way to address these problems within our communities. For example, there are over 75 drug consumption rooms where people can inject their drugs under medical supervision. Now, these services are proven to not only reduce the harm and the cost associated with injecting drug use, but they also increase entry into treatment, therefore enabling an individual to recover. The idea is you've got a warm um, and safe uh, hygienic environment to inject, so you have a little table like this, uh, hopefully there'd be a mirror there. I mean, this is just a... a quick idea of what it could look like. Um, on entry you'd be given obviously your strong water, uh, your uh, chosen needle and um, barrels, although we would advise you on what would be the best one to use. Um, hand washing facilities, there'd be hot water basin for vein dilatation. Um, obviously alcohol free wipes, a disinfectant, of course common wall for after shots. Um, then you have your shot, uh, get rid of the Equipment in your sink bin, um, so the up and go basically, and um, that's the idea. Throughout this video, I will be asking key professionals, uh, service users, and ex service users what they think about the idea of having a safe consumption room in Birmingham. I spoke to a pastoral worker who does street outreach for rough sleepers to share his experience of homelessness and injecting drug use. So, yeah, so I go down into the car parks and yep. to like some of the, the the squats and, and mm. the archways and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And we see people like, you know, either shooting up or they're, they're drunk out of their heads, if you know what I mean, drinking yep. away. Yeah. But the filth and the needles that are lying around, I mean, you, you wouldn't get your breath, you know, you just think, are we living in England? Mm. Yeah. Is this England? Um, you know what I'm saying? It's frightening, mm. really. And you see all the images of, you know, like, like for instance, you go down the arches and they built all them really nice properties <laughs> just above it, you know, you just mm. think, Two different worlds. People are complete denial, aren't they? They don't want to know it's yeah. there. Yeah, that's right. Do you know what that's I mean? That's right. At the side, at the yeah. mind. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, and then when they do come across somebody that's dead, they're thinking, how did they get here in the first place? There you go. And, and then they frightened and yeah. they think, there's yeah. a human being there that's, yeah. 
that's ended up dead. Yeah. But how did he get there? Well, yeah. What are we doing? Or what are, what are the people that are supposed to be paid doing? I interviewed two injecting drug using rough sleepers um, and asked them if they would use a safer consumption room and why. It's, it's safer, it's warmer, and you, you, can, you don't have to rush, you can calm down, do it your own time and know that there's someone there if things do go wrong. Because things do go wrong. Yeah. I've also spoke to about 30, 40 other users and mm -hmm. they, they said that it's the best idea that it's come up. Where about you inject at the moment in Birmingham? Car parks. Anywhere out of the way. Yeah. We're not going to get disturbed because I have trouble getting myself and I've only got to hear footsteps and I'll just stick it in and, I, and get an abscess. And that happens a lot. Do you know what to do about, uh, if one of your friends was to uh, overdose? Would you know yeah, what to yeah, do? yeah, yeah. I'll come to first aid, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. But the only trouble is where people go and have, do the stuff, have a hit, mm. there's not a phone box close, close by. So that's three minutes, four minutes where I can run to a phone box. Then yeah. put, that could save someone's life. That's a matter Absolutely. of life or death. Would you listen to the advice given on safer injecting most, there? Most definitely, yeah. Would the people there that you could ask questions about? Mm -hmm. you could, just say if you had a dodgy batch of gear and mm. something quite a bit happened, you mm. went over, there'd be a nurse on site to, you know, to attend your needs. Mm. Um, you'd have someone there showing you how to safe inject. Yep. Yep. Um, any questions you could ask, they would probably be answered by someone who would be there. I asked an ex-service user about his experiences of injecting in public and what he thought about a safer consumption room in Birmingham. Have you ever had to use in public in the yes, past? Yes, I have. I've used so where about did you use? Subways, flat stairs, um, wherever I could get a, like, a place where I could use in it. And how did it feel to use in those places? It f felt dirty, but had nowhere else to use in it. I know, like my family didn't want to know me, so so I couldn't go anywhere else in it. Uh, have you ever had any miss hits? <laughs> yeah, three or four. <laughs> and then what, what happened then? What did uh, you do? Just had to go out and score again because once you ever miss it, you're not getting the effect off it, so it's just a waste of money. And then you have to go out and beg or rub for it to get right. it again. And uh, so it's a bit like, disturbing and that as well. So would you have used a safe consumption room if there was one? Yeah, I would, would have gone. Yeah, prefer that because like at least there's no kids walking past when you're doing it, and, uh, and I've, I've had kids walk past me mm. and I've had to hide or whatever I'm doing. And uh, when we used to use in it, we could have an old dose and lose the edge. Uh, because your mates wouldn't be there, they'd just run off, and at least if you've got nurses there, other people. And it feels more at ease you know, if you're in them places and you're not like, around kids and not around the public, and you know, you're only in yeah. a safe environment. And, uh, so, yeah. I interviewed a long-term femoral injector um, and asked him to share his experiences of his injecting drug use in public places. So, where about did you used to inject in, in the past? In toilets, mostly in toilets. Sometimes during the summer, I used to go on the uh, multi-storey car park. Oh, okay. The the bloke on on the uh, like the shed outside the uh, car park. Yeah. They they know they know what you're going to do. You know yeah. what I mean? If you're just yeah. walking in, yeah. they've got a good idea. So and, what uh, what kind of damage have you uh, suffered? Oh my God. That was the the femoral artery burst. Yeah. In my groin. That was through. <sighs> really misuse from my part. So yeah. do you think if you was to come to a safe consumption room with these drug workers, trained drug workers and nurses on site to advise you on safe injecting, do you think that would have happened to you? No, I don't think it would have done, no. I asked a hostel manager who deals with injecting drug users on a regular basis what she thought of having a safer consumption room in Birmingham. There's too many places out there, disuse places, parks, that are at risk to children, members of the public, mm -hmm. general society. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs to be brought to light more so that this, this isn't a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Many of those that are on the streets won't have access to benefits yep. because they won't have either the know-how or just have not got the, the get up and go to do mm -hmm. it. At least if somebody's there with a, any, any luck, it will reduce crime rates Absolutely. because they've got an income coming in. Um, there's not the possibility of walking into, I don't know, a park, tissues, mm, buildings, mm. having a dead body, having yep. needles, all the paraphernalia yep. left all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People just stigmatise drug, drug addicts, they're bad people, they're not bad people. Mm. They've just got an addiction that needs to be helped. I wanted to know what a nurse thought of a safe consumption room uh, due to the fact that she deals daily with the consequences of poor and risky injecting behaviour. I think anywhere, mm -hmm. anywhere that can save the lives of people, it's got to be a good thing. 
hasn't it? That's that's the 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 moral issue really, and it's it, it's a moral issue. You need to save lives, and if that does, then then I think yeah, it's very necessary. I think that's a good idea, and um, I I also think that you know you would be coming or you would be meeting people that you would not see otherwise, and and we find that you know that that we have certain people that come and see us, other people you have to go and find them. Yeah. But this would be somewhere in between, I think. So it'd be like outreach extended because it will be an outreach clinic, but mm. they will be coming there. It's got to be trialled at least, I think, just to see whether it would work, you know. Um, and for us, yes, I think it would be... We see people in crisis. They come to us in crisis at times, you know, where, where they've had DVTs, um, they've got abscesses weeping, um, um, and, you know, and chronic infections of, 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 of groin sinuses, you know, and sometimes they are in that acute situation that we have to send them to hospital. Uh, we're here at the QE hospital in Birmingham. Uh, we're currently waiting for a uh, next service user. It's been drug-free for many years now, uh, but as a result of poor injecting techniques, uh, especially femoral injecting, um, he's developed ulcers in the last year or so, so he has to come to hospital um, to have an operation, which I believe is quite costly. No, 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 so, um, you've just come out of theatre, I believe. Uh, what did they do to you today? I had some surgery on my right leg to uh, have the vein closed up with a laser that was causing an ulcer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but you have been drug free for seven years now? I have, yeah. But you're still suffering complications? Yes, I am. Yeah. And when did this start then, your ulcers? The ulcer started about three years ago. So, at that stage you've been clean four years yeah. and then complications mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Um, how many operations have you had since those ulcers started? I have had I think three operations on the ulcers themselves, yes. Wow. And um, the bandages? I am in compression bandaging. I have been for the last year um, constantly. Okay. Um, and I have them done three times per week. Three times a week? So my dressings are changed three times per week. Three times a week at mm -hmm. 35 pounds a go, that's mm -hmm. roughly 100 pounds a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what complications did you suffer back then in, in your using days? Yeah, the worst complication I suppose was, um, I, I nearly lost my life in 1992, well, you know, um, and I almost lost my leg. Uh, I had something called compartment syndrome, I was injected in my groin, got a lot of internal bleeding yep. and I got something called compartment syndrome in my left leg which caused my leg to compartmentize mm -hmm. and uh, my skin, my tissue, my muscles started to die away, I got something called necrotizing fasciitis, yep. you know, it's a flesh eating bug, I got septicemia and I was in hospital for five and a half months, at the worst I was five stone in weight, Ooh. I was in intensive care for over a month. And during that time I was in there, I, must, I had over 30 surgeries on my leg. Whoa. Yeah. To remove bits of necrotic tissue, bits of muscle. You know, the whole back of my leg is missing. Okay. You can still see where the stitches were, you know what I mean? All the way down my leg. Mm. I was, I, this leg was open. They had to cut it open and they left it open for a period of about four months. And then they would come in and it was just packed mm -hmm. with, with like wadding. And they would pull it out and you know and, and, and check to see if it was still kind of decaying away if you like and then they would cut more and more pieces off. The scar also goes down the outside of my leg on the other side here. So you was lucky uh, not to lose your leg. I should or have your lost life. my leg. I should have lost my leg, yeah. yeah. And they told my parents at the time I wouldn't live through the episode, you know. Um, their actual words were, do you want would you, they wanted my parents to sign the paperwork to take my leg off because I was in such excruciating pain. Uh, they said they wanted to take my leg off and make me comfortable before I died because I wouldn't live out of the week. Uh, my parents obviously refused to sign the paperwork and I didn't die and I didn't lose my leg. You know, I must have had maybe 50 surgeries in my time. I had 30 surgeries in the one sitting, in the one visit to hospital. In the five months I was there I had 30, 35 surgeries but I've had dozens of surgeries since and previous. I've been in treatment for a long time uh, and post-treatment I'm still suffering major implications and complications as a result of my injecting, mm. you know. I'm going to be stuck in compression, bandaging and stockings for the rest of my life and it's not a pleasant prospect. If I would have had the chance of accessing somewhere safe and clean mm. to use, um, like a safer injecting room or a safer mm. consumption room, mm. I reckon the damage I caused myself in my early teens injecting on the streets of London mm. and Birmingham 
injecting out of puddles and toilet bowls, oh. you know, could have been averted. Some of this could have been, you know, Definitely. the drain I, I have put on the, on the NHS system, maybe might not happen. Mm. You know. Well, that was, uh, that was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, I feel deeply saddened uh, that this guy's been clean for seven years and yet uh, is still suffering um, complications due to his uh, risky injecting behaviour all these years ago. Um, I just can't believe what he's gone through, I can't believe what he's going to have to go through um, and if something could have been, some intervention could have been done 20 plus years ago, um, that would have happened at, to that stage, to that extent. You know, uh, I'm just baffled by it and, and, and saddened. Well, I'm excited because um, we're on our way to Liverpool uh, to a drug consumption room conference uh, and I'm hoping to interview two key speakers from Switzerland, um, Jacob Hubb and Robert Emick. Um, they're the guys that opened the first one back in 1986. Um, so hopefully we'll hear some uh, good stories and good feedback about uh, drug consumption rooms. Um, and hoping to speak to Neil Hunt as well from the UK that's done some uh, extensive um, work on, uh, on drug consumption rooms in the past. Um, hope it goes well. Uh, my name is Neil Hunt. I'm a freelance researcher uh, with honorary positions at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the University of Kent. Thank you. Robert Hamick. I'm a psychiatrist and psychotherapist at the um, uh, University uh, Psychiatric Hospital in Bern and I'm responsible for the addiction services at this uh, hospital. My name is Jacob Hooper and I'm a director of a foundation in Bern that is working in the harm reduction field and we are also safe injection rooms. Okay, and I believe you were the, uh, the one that opened the first one in, yes. in Bern 1986. Yes. And after 25 years, uh, would you say they are successful in reducing drug-related deaths, uh, transmission of HIV? Yes, HIV infection uh, in Switzerland, in general, is among drug users very low. It's not the main group. Uh, there are other groups uh, that are more important nowadays. Just normal heterosexual uh, transmission is uh, on the lead. Um, and I, HIV dropped very much with uh, harm reduction and also especially with this needle exchange mm -hmm. in the um, safe injection room yeah. and deaths mm -hmm. of the people dropped very much too. Mm -hmm. And even with this uh, uh, facilities we integrated a lot of people into treatment mm -hmm. and we have uh, uh, less people using heroin in Switzerland. Wow. There is no overdose Overdose deaths in any of uh, the safe injecting facilities yep. in all of the world. That's correct. Not, not only uh, no. in yeah. our place. I can tell you in, in Birmingham, uh, between 2009 2010, uh, 33 people died uh, of heroin overdose. So that's three people every month that died in Birmingham. What do you think of that? Three people too much. Thank no, you. Nobody. Every month, three people yeah. died in Birmingham. This is just Birmingham, this is not UK, this is just Birmingham alone. What do you think my biggest problem is going to be in the UK to open up a safe consumption room in Birmingham? Um, you, well, the, there are several big challenges that you face. Uh, I think the, the risk of political opposition, because this is an area where it's a very vulnerable population, but uh, there's not a lot of votes in it for politicians. So it needs a politician who is brave, compassionate, uh, and is prepared to champion an unpopular cause. Uh, so I think that, that, that's one area. Uh, the other area that is very important at, at the moment, of course, is cost. Uh, mm -hmm. Because in order to introduce a, a drug consumption room, clearly there are some costs in terms of staffing, uh, equipment. Um, now, uh, it's, it's not, as I was explaining uh, when I was talking earlier, it's not actually necessarily that expensive to do it. When people think about the big demonstration projects in Vancouver and Sydney, That's right. you don't need anything like that in, because of the, the UK situation is a much more distributed population of injecting drug yep. users. So, so really drug consumption rooms, I think in our big cities like Birmingham, will map onto safe, uh, in, onto, into needle exchanges yep. fairly 
naturally. And yeah. so you've got the planning issues already substantially addressed yeah. because you've got the service there. Yeah. You've got the sort of st the, the staff as a core resource mm -hmm. that you can, or you can draw on. Uh, you've got a lot of the equipment that you need yeah. already coming in and out. Finally, I wanted to hear from the person with the most experience in dealing with injecting drug users in Birmingham. Um, Dr. Judith Yates has worked with injectors for over 30 years and is well aware of the dangers and consequences of risky injecting behaviour. I am astonished that we don't have one. I think we should have one. Um, uh, we pretend that this doesn't happen. We pretend that people, young people aren't gathering in unsafe houses and squats around the city. We know that they are. I mean, for you know, 20 or 30 years I've known that this is happening and the fact we, we, we just look the other way, we pretend it doesn't happen and if we could, clearly the, the, the thing that people need is, 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 is first is needle exchange and, yeah. and is prescribed uh, opiate substitutes methadone, yeah. so we take yeah. But to get to that stage of accepting that treatment, some people are not there exactly. and the sooner we can get people into meeting with professionals and getting help and getting advice, the sooner we can help them to move along and stop damaging themselves and also the shorter the like the time hopefully that they're damaging themselves so that we don't see the longer term effects of Absolutely. of um, of poor technique and, and yeah. infections and, and the, yeah. everything that goes along with it. The research has been done and we all know the costs of these in, these yeah. things and this simple intervention early yeah. can prevent all these all these damages later even if they're not ready yet to come into treatment at least they can get some help and advice and they can prevent um, uh, quick they can prevent infections they can learn not to damage themselves in the short term and then in the medium term we can get them away from the damaging behavior yeah. and into treatment yeah. I've read I've not visited but I've read mm -hmm. about other cities and other parts of the world other countries where um, where young people are being helped in this way mm. and, and, uh, and I think it's time we had one in Birmingham, really I do. Uh, unfortunately uh, the police declined to be interviewed for this documentary but um, some um, police officers I spoke to uh, are actually for such a facility. They are fully aware that you will not stop people injecting drugs uh, and they agree that we're already giving them uh, injecting equipment that we know they're going to use to inject illicit drugs. So why can't, give, why can't we give them somewhere safe to do so? Uh, it, it, it's, it's beyond me. Any place in the world where these have been set up, public injecting is reduced, uh, many drug users have access treatment uh, as a result of drug consumption room, uh, and the health services obviously uh, ben greatly benefited from it, you know, as well as crime being cut down, you know. So uh, all in all, um, it, it's a winner, you know. But again, we are faced with a moral uh, dilemma. Uh, which politician is going to endorse a, su such a venture, you know? Uh, it's about time we do something um, that is pragmatic about street injecting. And evidence clearly, clearly demonstrates their, their value for money, you know? Um, drug consumption rooms not only save money, they save lives. Is it our duty of care um, to look after those hard-to-reach uh, individuals in our communities? I think it is, don't you?